Good afternoon and welcome to The Pulse with me, Daniel Dazi. Let's take a look at the headlines. Two persons have died in two robbery incidents in different parts of the country. In one case, armed men stood in the middle of the road and opened fire at oncoming traffic. The police will join us with updates on investigations. Also coming up, Electoral Commission's admission of the presence of minors and foreigners on the new voter register raises questions about the need for the compilation of the role. Today, we break down the results of the 36-day exercise. Also, former President Mahama promises the clergy that the NDC would hold an insult-free campaign. Now, media monitoring reports, however, show that radio stations loyal to his party are in the thick of it. All this and more coming up here on The Pulse with me, Daniel Dazi. Welcome. Good afternoon once again. Now, one person has been shot dead with six others in critical condition after a robbery attack at Yeji in the Bono East region. The robbery attack is reported to have occurred at Cobre around 5.15 p.m. Tuesday evening. According to reports, the robbers, numbering three and wielding guns, stood in the middle of the road to fire shots to move to force moving vehicles to stop. Adum News' Daniel Techi joins me with details of it. Daniel. How did it happen? Hi, Daniel, if you can hear me, how did this happen? Right, Adum News is Daniel Tichi will join us with more details of this robbery attack, a highway robbery indeed, at Yeji in the Bono East region. Um, we understand, like I said earlier, that three armed men stood in the middle of the road and opened fire at oncoming traffic. This was their way of ensuring that the vehicles move off the road and park on the shoulders so they're able to attack them. There has been a recent spate of robbery incidents reported. And this morning, this afternoon, we are reporting two already. Daniel Techi of Adum News is with us. Daniel, tell us, how did this happen? Right, Daniel, are you there? Unmute your microphone, Daniel. You're joining us via Zoom. Unmute your microphone. Okay. Yes, I can now hear you. Tell us how exactly this happened. Okay, now. Hello. Oh, okay. Well, it was exactly 5.15 to 5.30 yesterday um, p.m. I mean p.m. It was uh, when we had a call, a distress call that Arm robbers has uh, blocked the road, lead the highway, lead from um, Masi to Yeji. Uh, in Hong Kong, Kubri, there is a sharp cliff before you, you enter into the Yeji territory. It was there that we heard that the arm robbers have blocked the road. Um, the first car that they pounced on was a Sanyong car that is carrying passengers from Masi to Yeji. Now, uh, upon the driver uh, pouncing on the Arm robbers on the way, he decided to make sure he protects his passengers or the, the traders who are on board. So um, one of the robbers, according to the driver, pointed a gun at him just to stop the vehicle. But he wouldn't uh, care to that of the gun that was pointed at him. So uh, he has to make sure he speed up or he step on the accelerator to uh, speed up and also get rid of the armor robbers but they couldn't get none of the skills that he tried to apply so uh, the one of the robbers shot through the car and unfortunately he hit one of the passengers who was sitting just beside the driver so he passed on right away after the incident now that wasn't all a taxi from Atibubu was also stopped at the same spots Right, Daniel. To you... Some other motorbikes, uh, three motorbikes, one taxi, and one Sion, that is a minibus from Kumasi. They were all stopped at their spots, and that was when the robbing occurred. 
Now, three, uh, one died, six of the victims got injured and was sent to St. Matthias Hospital for treatment. On the spot, about five of the victims have been discharged, but one was on admission. Uh, I think barely that's what happened at the scene when the incident uh, occurred. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much. Have police been to the scene? Yes, uh, the police yesterday, have, upon hearing that they're having an incident of that nature, they will. Right. Hello, Daniel. Unfortunately, since we've lost Daniel Tichi, thank you very much, Daniel, for coming through with that report. But fishermen across the central region have started a one week protest against the activities of Cycle, the transshipment of fish at sea in Ghana. The fishermen say they are fortified by the revelations in Joy News' hotline documentary, Cycle, when the last fish is caught, and wants the government to ban the activities of Cycle to save the fishing industry. Now, the fishermen who have been in red say they are in the bumper season, but they often return with empty nets, a situation that is killing the fishing industry. Central Regional Secretary of the Canoe Fishermen Association, Ken Arthur, says the government intervention in this is key to saving the over 3 million people that directly depend on the sea. It means there's a danger. Uh, but this one uh, is a danger against our livelihood. As fishermen, uh, we are supposed to be in the bumper season of the year. That is starting from July to September. But as you can see, uh, the whole place is dry. From water region to western region, the whole place, all the landy beaches are dry. Why? Because the Saiko people, uh, the Chinese, have taken over our seas. And this time around, if you go into the sea, you observe that they are everywhere. And the artisan fishermen don't have any place even to uh, cast their nets. And it's becoming uh, very difficult even to survive. You could see a lot of children around. If you want to feed on, it's become very difficult. Uh, some few months ago, some few months ago, it came to the limelight nationwide on joy that um, psycho business is indeed killing the fishing industry, the artisan fishing industry in Ghana. Um, based on that documentary, there became an eye opener that Ghanaians, we need to rise up. The fishermen, we need to rise up. Those of us who are directly involved in fishing, we need to rise up. Uh, so this is to create awareness and to plead with our president, the able president, the listening president, that he has done it before, where he banned psycho for some three months. And within those periods, you observe that fishermen were very happy with him. So we are pleading with him again, as is being stated in the 2020 budget, that psycho will be banned in 2020. We are the peak season. We beg him, we plead with him to ban psycho. Uh, to chase out these Chinese from our water so that as Ghanaians, as artisan fishermen. Now, Richard Kojonyako has been interacting with some fishmongers and fishermen at the beaches. He joins us via Zoom. So, what have these fishmongers and fishermen been telling you, Richard? Well, so basically, what they are telling us is that they are in their bumper season, the season where they are supposed to get. A lot of cash but that is not the situation they go and then they return with empty nets and it's a source of worry for them for the over three million people scattered along the coastal belt of the country from the volta region western region central region and greater Accra region they, they they only depend on the sea and they say that this is being destroyed by chinese uh, the chinese and then these industrial trawlers and these are Ghanaian fronted companies. So they front these Chinese vessels and then they cause havoc on the sea. So they go to the sea and they don't get anything. This is the time they say they should have gotten a lot of catch, but now the situation is different. So they've declared one week. And so if you go to the beach right now along the coastal belt, uh, the fishermen are in red armbands. Um, they have also, um, their flags are also red and they are doing this to 
signal government that enough is enough and they want the thing stopped. And so that is what the fishermen are saying at the moment. If I'm to understand what psycho is, Richard, it's when fishing vessels go out to sea and transfer, uh, receive fish from larger vessels and bring them back to shore. Uh, do these fishermen not know any of the, those being involved in the illegal trade? Well, so they tell me that they know the people that are involved. They know apart from the Chinese vessels or the, vest, the foreign vessels that are operating illegally on Ghanaian waters. They also know that there are some fishermen that are also recipients of the fish that are caught by these psycho, um, these industrial trawlers. So the fish, the catch they have on the high seas, they are divided into three. The, the trawlers pick the best from them. And then the second uh, type is that they also freeze some of them and send them to places like Apam and then Elmina. So if you go to the Elmina fishing, um, 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 fishing place, you will see some of these psycho uh, fishermen. All that they do is that they meet these trawlers halfway on the sea and then they get the catch. And the third one is that these are little pelagics, small, small pelagics, small, small fish. And so when they catch them, they're unable to use them. And so they throw them back into the sea. And this poisons the sea. And so um, at a point, they would go to fishing and they would never get any catch because the sea has already been poisoned. And so that is what psycho really means. So if I'm to understand what you're saying, Richard, those are the Cape Coast Beach say they are not the ones who are involved in the trade. And it's the fishermen at Elmina who are psycho fishermen. Well, so, uh, uh, Daniel, uh, in the 2020 budget, government puts in the budget that they are going to end cycle in 2020. So they allotted some money to the fight against cycle. But the fishermen say that they've stayed there and then nothing of this sort is happening. But the people at Elmina and Apam who are recipients of these small, small fish, what they say is that it is not their fault because uh, if they don't go and meet them halfway on the sea, that catch will go waste. The people will still throw them in the sea. So it has become a source of livelihood for them too. But it's not all the fishermen that benefit from this trade. And so they want that practice to end. And then government should also uh, heed to the promise to them to end cycle because it is something that is destroying the fishing industry. Richard Kojonyako, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon with those updates. Let's move to the Volta region where a violent protest in Japong, the North Tone District, uh, seized the flow of traffic on the Accra Ho highways for several hours earlier this morning. Youth in the area took to the streets to mount a roadblock with burning tires to register their anger at what they describe as weak policing in the district. The protest follows the murder of a resident in an alleged contract killing on Tuesday night at about 10.30 p.m. The police, however, managed to clear the road for traffic to flow and restore calm to the town. Volta Regional Police PRO Prince Dobache joins us via Zoom. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, tell us, give us the details of the robbery itself to begin with. Please unmute your microphone. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I am going to say that regarding the incident uh, last night, about 11 p.m., when the young man had closed from his shop and was going home, uh, the assailants attacked him and uh, unfortunately uh, killed him. Uh, that is by way of what really happened yesterday. Okay, we understand that this demonstration was as a result of what happened yesterday. Have you been able to clear up the demonstration or the boys are still on the road? Well, we have been able to clear the road to traffic, uh, you know, in the early hours of the morning. Um, this is a development that uh, we are not happy about. I think uh, we can backtrack a bit to what happened in the month of March, when the assemblyman for Tsuagope uh, was killed, a similar development happened. I am not sure if the youth uh, at 
would have taken a cue from that uh, unfortunate incident to register their displeasure. But uh, investigation into the previous incident at Sugakope had given us some indication that most of the times uh, people who even find themselves involved in the commission of these heinous crimes turn around to incite others to embark on this kind of demonstration. Uh, typically regarding the Sugakope incident, uh, our investigation has uncovered that one person who actually masterminded that whole incident was among those who incited the youth and mobilized them to demonstrate and block the road to traffic, as we have seen today in Japan. Uh, we have always given the assurance that, yes, our mandate is clear. If we must uh, enjoy the cooperation, the level of cooperation that we require to do our job all the time, we are going to be successful in our work. So if a crime is committed, um, it is the duty of the police to do investigation. And so we ask the public to cooperate with us so that we can come out with, you know, the very, right. very uh, right outcomes. And so when these incidents happen and the youth go on rampage, mm. it does not add anything to our investigation. Rather, mm. it tries to detract uh, the cost of investigation. And perhaps it might be a deliberate attempt by those who are behind it. But we can give the assurance. But, but that, is that yeah, what you suspect, um, Mr. Dobache? Yeah. Is it your suspicion that some of the people demonstrating could actually be behind the robbery? Yes, I'm mentioning this reference, what we have uh, come out with from the Soviet government. But do you have any evidence is, to suggest that this could is, be the case? Uh, Unfortunately, we seem to have lost that connection with Prince Dogbache. He's the Volta Region Police Public Relations Officer. We're still live on The Pulse, and this is your election headquarters. Now, the Electoral Commission says it is beginning the process to remove some persons it says are minors and foreigners from the new voters register. Presenting the provisional report after the conclusion of the 36-day exercise, Chairperson Jean Mensa said the minors and foreigners are among the 16.9 million persons who are currently registered uh, in the new voters register. Take a listen. It is evident that most of the challenge cases were from border regions, with the exception of Ahafo. And it gives reason to assume that the challenge cases relate to citizenship issues emanating from the infiltration of foreigners. At a later date, we will shed more light on our findings. The Commission is mindful of the infiltration of foreigners at a number of our registration centers. Additionally, we are aware that a number of minors have found their way into the register. We are confident that the challenge processes initiated at all districts throughout the country who unearth these illegal persons and rid the register of those who do not qualify to be there on. We are confident that the register that would be used for the 2020 elections will be a wholly owned Ghanaian enterprise, reflecting qualified Ghanaians and Ghanaians only. I'll come to the important subject of the total number of registered voters at the end of day 36. That is the first, the main registration exercise. We now come to the number of persons who registered as at day 36. The number of persons amount to or add up to 16,932,492. At the end of the two day mop up exercise, 30,814 persons had successfully registered as part of the 2020 voters registration exercise. In a nutshell, the total number of registered voters at the end of the 2020 voter registration exercise stands at 
The Electoral Commission says such persons will be taken off the register uh, through challenge cases currently pending. The process of deduplication and adjudication, which are currently ongoing, will flag multiple registrations in the system. Additionally, the challenge system put in place during the registration and exhibition exercise will further flag unqualified voters on the register. Ultimately, these processes will contribute to the cleaning of the register and ensure its integrity and credibility ahead of the 2020 election. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's Let the Citizen Know encounter. And before we take a bow, we would like to assure the good people of Ghana that as a commission, we are determined to put in place and ignite all mechanisms available to us to clean the register and rid it of all unqualified persons, i.e. minors and foreign nationals. We are confident that at the end of the day, we will present Ghanaians with a credible re register that reflects Ghanaians only, a wholly owned Ghanaian endeavor. Now, let's go ahead and crunch some of the numbers that we have gotten from the Electoral Commission. Joining us for more on this is Deputy Head of our Political Desk, Winston Amwa, for more on this. Also joining us right now is Joseph Akable, who covered this briefing for Joy News. He joins us via Zoom. Joseph, how did the EC explain the issue of minors and foreigners on the electoral roll? Right, let's, let's go to um, Winston Amwa, who is with us in studio. Um, right, Winston, take us to the regional numbers. Yes, Daniel, so let me just quickly run you through the numbers as the uh, you know, electoral commission has presented it to all of us. And then we'll do a bit of analysis of it, because it's very important that um, you have a very good understanding of the numbers as presented by the electoral commission and what I mean, pertains previously. So if you look at the regional breakdown, uh, the Upper West region has uh, 470,271. That's the total number of registered voters for the Upper West region. And then uh, the Upper East has 653,730. The Northeast region, 288,393. Northern region, 1,047,530. But I guess one of the things people would want to look at, Daniel, uh, even as I mentioned these figures, it's a bit of a comparison between the 2019 figures, because the Electoral Commission had conducted a limited registration exercise in 2019, and that had been added to the previous numbers that we had. So, for instance, if you look at the uh, Upper West region, in 2019, the figure, according to the Electoral Commission, is 440,989. Now, we're told that the number is 470,271. So you're looking at about a 30,000 increase in those numbers. But of course, we would have done a limited voter registration this year. Anyway, we would have done that. Yes, yeah, so you would expect that the numbers will go into the 2020 elections where will be higher. Exactly. I'll, I'll explain that shortly. If you go to the Upper East region, in 2019, the figure was 697,778. But after the end of the mop-up, According to the Electoral Commission, we have 653,730. That's a reduction of over 40,000. Mm. Now, Daniel, let me just do a little bit of analysis here, because what I see, looking at the figures from 2000, I normally say that 1992, 1996 are outliers. We don't really you know, use them a lot for uh, analysis because of the circumstances around the time. But you would see that any time there's been a compilation of a new voters register, certain regions, or there's, there are some regions where there's a reduction in the number. Let me just do this. In 2000, in the Western region, the total number of registered voters was 1,076,778. By 2004, when we compiled a new voters register, the number had reduced to 1,007,816. That's a reduction of 69,000. Okay? So you could see that it happened there from 2000 
to 2004. 2004. Mm. What's about this time round? This time round, if you look at the Western regional figures, and I'd like to do something here because in the Western region, it's been split into two, Western North and Western and West South. But uh, because of the analysis, we'd actually, use, we'd actually merge the numbers. So you look at 2019, you're looking at 1,705,129. You're now looking at the two, 1,650,000. 759. Okay. That's interesting. That's also a reduction. Now, 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 you find that uh, the Western region is one of the decider regions. Yes. When it comes to the final election, because they often go with the winner of the, it's a swing region, yeah. as they like to call it. So what will this mean for the government in power and the opposition? Well, Daniel, what this means for the government in power is very simple. Now, the thing is, if you look at the numbers, consistently the Greater Accra region has had the most votes. Okay, people have actually talked about the Ashanti region, but they've never had lots of registered voters than the Greater Accra region. But the thing is that the voter turnout in the Ashanti region is always high. So even though a lot of people have registered in the Greater Accra region, the voter turnout in the Ashanti region is always high, and as a result, favors, in many of the instances, the current government. If you look at 2012, for instance, I just want to chip this in. In 2012, the Greater Accra had 2,792,576 registered voters. The Ashanti region had 2,557,122. Mm -hmm. That's like a, I mean, a gap of 200,000. Now, watch this. Number of persons who voted in the Greater Accra region, 2,174,645. But in the Ashanti region, it was 2,190,000, representing 85.65 voter turnout compared to the Greater Accra 77.87. And that's yeah. how they got a higher number than the Greater That's how they got a higher number That's than very the interesting. Mm -hmm. Winston, uh, let's go to Joseph Akable, who is joining us via Zoom to try and get a word from him. Um, Joseph, thanks for joining us. What, what uh, method did the EC say they would use to remove the minors and the foreigners from the register? <laughs> so for now, the commission explains that in terms of the challenge cases that have been filed, there are about 30,000 of them. And these have been filed at various levels, mostly in the districts. And it relates to one, the fact that uh, some foreigners have been registered. The second relates to uh, the fact that there are individuals uh, who are minors who have also been registered. And so the expectation is that with the 30,000 plus cases, once it goes to the challenge process and they are resolved, the EC expects that these ineligible persons will be taken off the register uh, with the chairperson assuring that it is on December 7th, you only have. Ghanaians who will be participating in these elections, and there will be Ghanaians who are of sound mind, who are 18 years at least, uh, will be participating in this process. Now, isn't the number 30,000 for number of challenges on the high side, Joseph? That is the figure. It's depending it's, it's the, the cases that have been found so far. So these are matters that have not been resolved. And so, I mean, there, there's a possibility that if they go through the process and they actually clear that they are actually Ghanaians, who are at least 18 years of age, it will mean that such persons will remain on a register. And so then again, it comes back to the arguments that have been made in the Supreme Court, which were to the effect that the AC had insisted that using the Ghana card and the passport, coupled with the guarantee system, was the surety of ensuring that only Ghanaians get onto the road. And we know for a fact that the guarantee process has been used in terms of the statistics that they put out today. And the main thing that has been used the most across the country is the Ghana card with the second being the guarantor system. The passports, not too many people use the passport. And so it raises the question again that it appears you have people either vouching for persons who are not qualified or persons who are not supposed to have access to the Ghana card have access to them, or as may be the case, uh, this whole challenge process will actually affirm those cards that have been issued. And so then it comes back to the point again that what informed the ACs uh, view that there were unqualified persons on the register. And Madame Jemensa explains that they have individuals who monitor the exercise across the country and if you point to them that they are minors and they are foreigners on the register, they intend to remove them. But the only way they can remove them assistance remains the challenge system that has been filed already. So has she given the assurance that these 30,000 people, if, well, whatever the tribunal decides, would sufficiently deal with the presence of minors and foreigners on the register? That will be one part of it. And she says that will ensure that uh, come December 7, you have only Ghanaians. In fact, in her own where she says a wholly Ghanaian enterprise in terms of the register. 
but, but the other issue also uh, that remains uh, has to do with the fact that there are also issue of duplicates. You know, the EC had indicated that they are running an offline system. And so there are persons who register at one place. Then when they re realize that the movement plan has caused the EC to come closer to their homes, they went to register. And so once they upload onto the system, they detect by matching the verification data and the names as well as the personal identity uh, information in terms of your age, date of birth, among others. When they match it and you are one person having the same, it matches it. And so they delete one of those ones. And so once that is also carried out, uh, it will give us a sense of the actual people and the registrants. So it could be the case that the numbers could go low. And that is why the AC, uh, despite giving us the figures today, still insists that they are provisional figures because there's still some more work that needs to be done uh, by way of the cleaning process before we even get to a level where the register is made available to the political parties, by which time we'll be going close to the election. The commission admits that this is the first time it has had to compile a register this late, but it's been a successful exercise in the words of the electoral commission chairperson. Joseph Akabli, thank you very much, Joseph, for us uh, at that news conference where Madam Jean Minza made that presentation. When Senamwa is still with me here in studio, very interesting revelation. The whole justification for the new register was the presence of minors and foreigners, but we still have them on the register. Well, um, Daniel, I think last two weeks when I spoke with uh, Dr. Shribo Kwaku, uh, his explanation was, well, your guess is as good as mine. You always would have minors on a voter's register. Um, the challenge the Electoral Commission would have is its ability to know who is a minor or not. Um, you, 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 you can always argue that if we have a Ghana card that, is, that all Ghanaians have, we certainly be able to tell whether you are 18 years or not 18 years. The challenge also is for the reg registration of the Ghana cards, for instance, are we certain of the ages that people show and come up with? There's always that challenge, and the politicians always have a way of registering uh, you know, minors or foreigners. Look, let's be honest with ourselves. The pol I mean, if there's one group of persons we should always blame for all of this, it is because elections are won right from the registration of voters. Mm. If you're able to get your friends to register, or if you're able to get people you know are going to support you to register, then you certainly can say, you know what? I think I'm certain I'm going to win this. Okay. Yeah. So that's why you see minors being registered. The Electoral Commission knows. The, my, my understanding, and based on the analysis, is that they had a belief that they could actually reduce this. They had a belief that with the new system they were putting in place, they could get this, you know, out of the way. But it didn't seem like it worked. I heard the numbers you read for the Upper East and Upper West yeah. region and how there was an increase yeah. if you look at the 2019 register. Does that suggest that perhaps that's been a border region, persons could have crossed the border to register? So there was actually a decrease in the Upper East region and an increase in the Upper West region. But my point is that if you look at the figures, in some of the regions, there's been a decrease. That would suggest to you, for instance, if you go to the Volta region, there's been a decrease. Now, if, if, if I say the Volta, you know, I'm using the OT and the Volta region. Together. together. So by how much? So in 2020, at the just end of the registration, so we have 1,282,814. For the OT and Volta region. OT and Volta. In 2019, you have 1,385,000. That's a reduction of over 100,000. But there's something unique here. In 2004, so let's look at the voter region figures. In 2000, they had 983,588. By the time they compiled a new voter's register in 2004, that number had reduced to 819,466, a reduction of almost 160,000. So it's a trend as opposed to a removal of foreigners? That trend, Daniel, is not a trend you see in all regions. In some regions you see it, and another time you don't see it. And so it looks like this, and if I look at the Volta region, I'm going to do this uh, analysis. Very controversial, but I'm going to do this. So in 2008 then, the number increases to 1,012,000. But in 2012, we compiled a new voter's register. 
when we compile the new voters register, the number increased again in the voter region from the 1,012,000 to 1,156,000. Okay. But then, in 2020, it's reduced. We've seen it happening in the Western region from 2000 to 2004. Okay? And we've seen it happening again in the Western region from 2019 to 2020. So what's the suggestion here? The suggestion is that in some of these border regions, a closure of borders sometimes affects the number of people who come in. And this is social science. I'm inferring. That's interesting. I'm it's, inferring. It's an interesting inference from the yeah. deputy head of our political desk, Wins Denamwa, um, who joined us for some analysis of the numbers from the Electoral Commission this morning. It's alive on the pulse with me, Daniel Dazit. There's a lot more coming up. Stay with us. This is still your election headquarters here on the pulse. Now, former president John Dramani Mahama is asking the clergy to assist the NDC to save the country from sinking under the current administration. He argues that the democratic gains achieved are being eroded, citing the bastardization and politicization of state institutions as evidence of tragedy befalling the country. The NDC flag bearer was speaking at a meeting with the clergy to introduce his running mate, Professor Nana Jeno Pukwajimai. Over 70% of our 30 million plus population is Christian. And this for me underscores the huge responsibility you have as leaders in terms of molding morally sound and ethically driven citizens, as well as providing spiritual guidance, teachings, and prayers. In the short period of time between March and July, when churches were unfortunately shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The absence of the church in the lives of our population has had the most telling impact. Your mandate as key stakeholders and development agents in our country is therefore crucial, especially with regards to the future of this great, great nation of ours that we all love and call our own. There have been some unfortunate developments in our country over the last few years that I'm sure you have noticed even if you may not have publicly spoken about them. Without mincing words, I must state that we're in danger of losing our way, and today our country is at the crossroads in our democratic dispensation. We used to be the shining light and point of reference in Africa when it comes to the independence and integrity of our democratic institutions. Today, all these gains we proudly achieved as a people as a country are being eroded and setting us back several decades. A few days ago, I talked about the tragedy that has befallen us. And permit me to restate, I said, this particular tragedy is the destruction and politicization of our institutions, a judiciary that lacks impartiality, an oppressed parliament, a pliant electoral commission, an auditor general hounded out of office, a misused military, anti-corruption institutions in bondage, and an intimidated media, and a terrified moral society. Let me also add that not stopping there, the future generation of young people that we are nurturing, teaching and preparing to take over from us, have been deliberately perverted because of the insatiable desire to stay in power at all costs. Now, he also criticized President Ekufado after what he describes as his insatiable desire to stay in power at all costs. Mr. Mahama also pledged to run a clean campaign in spite of the attacks on him and his running mate. My running mate, Professor Nana Jinopokwajiman, whom I'm presenting to you today, has been encouraged by, a few days ago by the Osu Manche to be strong and courageous in the face of what he feared would be a barrage of insults and attacks on her person, just because she has decided to serve her country at the highest level, to help shape its destiny and ensure shared prosperity for all. Indeed, these unprovoked attacks and insults and lies have already started. 
But I can assure you and all Ghanaians that Nana Jane and myself will never engage in insults and name calling of our opponents in, in response. <laughs> our children are watching, listening, and copying what we do. And it is, it's important that we continue to serve as good role models to them. Now, the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God Church and the President of the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council, Reverend Paul uh, Yao Frimpon Manso, cautioned the political parties against hate speech. He admonished them to rather focus on their campaign message. Let your conversation be seasoned with salt. As we go out, let me tell my dear politicians and everyone here something. First and foremost, whenever you want to speak to the public, there are three things you must consider. First, you have to go and appeal to the intellect. You have to go with facts that can be proven and substantiated. Because you go there and you throw something, you can prove it and defend it. And when you have the facts, you go there also to appeal to the emotion, to gather people, to show empathy with you, to draw the person to you. And then, after you got the emotion, then you appeal to the will. So for every message that goes out, we appeal to the intellect through force that can be substantiated and justified. Then you draw the person through your humor, your lifestyle, your stories, and everything. You get the person to you, then you appeal to the decision. I've also said something here which I want to make mention. As we go out, whatever we put out is a data. So the way we presented it, we presented to help the people analyze it and give meanings. So whatever you say, you throw it to the public domain, it is interpreted by history, by your ideology, and by the environment or the common practice. So we must know that what people can twist our mind, our words, and give meaning to it, and it is not normally like that. So we must be able to package our message so much that the distortions and all the things that they want to mispresent you will be minimized. This Thursday, the 13th of August, the Imani Center for Policy and Education and your election headquarters bring you the Minority Political Parties and Independent Candidates Election Debate live from the University of Professional Studies Accra, UPSA, from 8 p.m. Six independent candidates will lock horns in a rigorous interrogation of their ideas. Marik Kofigan, Kofi Kurante, S. Okori Ampopo, Carl Ebo Morgan, Unipayade, Osumte, and Dr. Tom Assise will have their policy alternatives scrutinized, moderated by head of the Joy News political desk, Evans Mensa, and Joy News anchor, Emepa Apau, the minority political parties and independent candidates election debate live from 8 p.m. on Thursday, 13th August, from the UPSA, only on Joy 99.7 FM, Love 99.5 FM, on the Joy News Channel, our affiliates across the country, online, and across our social media platforms. So I have in the Pulse with me, Daniel Dazi, and today we continue with our build-up to the minority political parties and independent candidates' election debate as we count down to December 7. In 24 hours, the Imani Center for Policy and Education and your election headquarters bring to you the minority political parties and independent candidate election debate. Our guest today is Marek Kofigan, another independent candidate who is confident of beating both the NDC and the NPP come December 7. Let's get to know him better. Um, so, Mr. Gan, first of all, welcome. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. You are um, the first candidate in this election to release the manifesto. I, I believe so. Yes, yes. And so, as far as messaging goes, mm. there's a lot that you've developed. Yes. Um, so, I, I want us to go straight to the question of your alternative. Mm. Um, in terms of governance. What's the broad idea you're looking at? 
The broad idea is to build a country that works for every Ghanaian, not a few. That largely is the broader idea. Under that, we want to have a government that respects values, um, that is very big on ensuring that the systems do work, uh, in other words, the institutions and all that do work, um, but one which also is bound on accountability uh, and, and, and some level of creativity. Uh, we've, we've been playing around the same um, sort of governance system for so long. Whether it's delivering the quality we want, uh, I think we are all uh, sure now that it isn't. And so ours is to build a government that ensures that one, every Ghanaian gets involved, every Ghanaian benefits from the state um, in terms of leadership, but also that you know we build a country that we can be sure that will take us into the future. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest issues, and we have been discussing this throughout the week with all the candidates who come, mm. is we look at the issues that are facing us today right. and explore the alternatives that we have. Right. We have seen that the sanitation minister has said we are 85% through in making Accra the cleanest city mm. in Africa. Where do you stand on this? What do you think should be the solution? I, I, I don't think she's got it right. I, I don't know what the basis is. I mean, we, we all live in Accra. We, we've seen what is still happening in Accra. Um, we've got landfill sites that are choked, uh, and so they're spilling over uh, everywhere else. Uh, and so 85%, I, I don't know where she's gotten that number for, but that is way far from what the reality is. I mean, I put that on my wall uh, a day or so ago, uh, and the comments are just laughable. You know, for a government minister to make that assessment, it's almost as though she does not live in Accra. Um, I mean, we've said we have alternatives to this. Uh, one of the biggest alternatives we have is to ensure that we do put together another uh, processing plant for city waste um, that is likely to uh, manage city waste by another 90%, so that the landfill sites can, you know, start shutting down because they haven't helped and they aren't helping. Uh, and it's crucial that we reduce the number of landfill sites we have because, because of the diseases that we're getting out of that. Um, so that's one of the key things we want to do. We, we also have a bigger plan for uh, uh, drainages, uh, integrated drainages, not you know, build a gutter here, build a gutter there, not that kind of drainage. We, we have said that in our first year of office, we want to have an integrated plan um, for at least Accra and Kumasi in respect of the drainage system that must exist. And this is going to be led by the engineers of this country. Um, and then from year two and three, we should be getting fund funding to support uh, the building of this uh, <clears throat> drainage. So there is, there is quite a, a lot of thought that has gone into solving the sanitation problem. The, the challenge with sanitation is that the heart of it um, has been described as attitudinal. And in our Clean Ghana campaign, we have visited the, some of the most challenged communities here in Accra, for mm. instance, your Chocos and your Nimas and what have you. Mm. And we find that there's a large part of this that has to do with the people not understanding what waste disposal is, what waste sorting is. Right. How are you going to tackle this? Well, I mean, we, we often talk about, like you're saying, we often talk about attitudes. Uh, there's, there's largely one way in this country that we have been successful as treat, at treating or, you know, uh, shaping attitudes. It's enforcing the law. Unfortunately, that hasn't really happened in the last couple of, uh, uh, you know, uh, governments we've, we've had. Um, we have said one of the critical things we would also do is to ensure that laws are enforced without fear or favor. It is in enforcing these laws and making sure that people are punished for what is not right, then they learn that it cannot be done this way. Um, but if people do things and they don't get punished, the next day they're going to do it again. The next day somebody else who realizes that they haven't been punished is also going to join them and do it again. So um, uh, one of our biggest agendas in not just sanitation but even road traffic and the rest is ensuring that we punish offenders. And for me, I have said even in the manifesto that we're going to make quite a lot of money from, from indiscipline. We're going to monetize indiscipline in this country. So you're, you're suggesting punishments being monetary uh, Not necessarily monetary. It could take many forms. I'm asking um, because you said you're going to monetize indiscipline. Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if it does involve money, then it does involve money because people must begin to feel you know, the pinch somewhere. Uh, once they start to feel the pinch somewhere, and one of the ways to feel the pinch is economical. So 
Uh, yes, we are not oversighting the use of money as, as a pinch board. Uh, we will use that where, where it is necessary. The legislative change you require to make something like this, it means you'd have to really build consensus ab across both political parties. Political parties which you do mm. not subscribe to, political parties which, if you are successful, would have lost in the election. Mm. How do you build those bridges? Oh, uh, you see, I, I think this is, a, this is a debate that uh, keeps coming up. Uh, I think what we've, um, we've ended up assuming most of the time is that the fact that you know, parliamentarians are not in government means that they, all, they don't want something good for this country. They do want something good for this country. Uh, and it is up to us to show both the Ghanaian people and the parliamentarians that, look, this is what we intend to do for this country. At that point, it becomes their justification to the Ghanaian people why they will not, you know, uh, uh, follow through with a plan that the Ghanaians themselves know that is going to be for their good. Um, so we want to have the difficult conversations. Uh, uh, Daniel, you and I know in the last couple of years, at least in the last 27 years, uh, we've not really had uh, a, sorry, uh, a legislature that is a check on the executive. Largely, the legislatures have been a rubber stamp of, of the executive. Having an independent candidate in executive office means that some hard decisions are going to be made, some hard conversations are going to now be made. Um, and we are not afraid to make those hard conversations. At the end of the day, the MP on the other side and, and the executive on this side should be able to say, you know what, we agree that this is something that is good and all for Ghana. Uh, and, and the joy of it is that, look, if, if, that, if that MP has something good happening in their constituency, he stands a more a better chance of getting re-elected again if he if he mm. if he shows that he supported it. Um, another issue that we, we dealt with earlier today, mm. the new electoral rule still has minors and foreigners. The EC chairperson, Madam Jean Mensah, made mention of that. What do you make of this issue and how far this this case has travelled? Uh, you know what, Daniel? I I this this whole uh, every four years election. Uh, uh, role thing for me it's a real pain it's it's something that is insulting to our intelligence i think we should have gone past this stage way by now we're 63 years old as a country uh, and we still can have what i want to see is one centralized database of of citizen id uh, a citizen id that is fed in by the various institutions let the birth and registry be the only institution in this country that can amend the health, uh, sorry, the birth section of that registry. Let the police be the only uh, institution in this country that can make entries uh, regarding criminal, you know, uh, uh, issues. Let the judiciary be the only, in, you know, institution that can make uh, 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 inputs on, on, on judgments that have been passed against you. So we have one systemic, centralized, you know, database that we don't have to do this four years, four years to, look, we spent over 200 mil. Uh, just doing this. Next four years, I pray this is not the case because next four years, I want to see this stop. We can't be spending this amount of money when we could have actually used the same amount of money to do something very tangible, very concrete, um, so that you know you just have one card and you know that it takes care of everything in this country. You don't uh, think that the Electoral Commission should make a decision on their own as an independent institution? Well, th there's no problem with the with the institution. Sorry, the EC making a decision of their Which own. Which is what they did. Th th there's no problem with that. There are two issues we're dealing with here. The EC making a decision based on who has an identity as a Ghanaian. What we are saying is that let's have one centralized unit that that ensures that you know every institution in this country accepts that as the one proof of identity okay. so that you know the ec just has to say okay let's go into that database let's pull all those who are above 18 years uh, and and beyond uh, this year and mind you as we have said the hospitals are going to be responsible for things like removing people's name out because they have died once you have been labeled as dead, your, 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 your details fall flat. But we have a country where access to health care is a challenge. So if you're going to depend on hospitals in the first place, that mm. is problematic. No, actually, this is going to help health care. Because one of the biggest problems we have in health care is data. Kwame, uh, sorry, uh, Daniel, if you move to Ketekrachi, for example, you are probably going to be told to go back to your hospital and get your file and bring it. 
after 63 years. The question is about the number of people living in rural Ghana mm. who are born at home mm -hmm. and who are born in places without adequate healthcare personnel. But then we need and to so shape having, that. Having that challenge means we, we, we can't we, rely on a system no, like that for healthcare delivery. No, we can't. Everything does have a solution. I get what you're saying that, you know, uh, people are born out, and it does happen. You know, uh, my cousins, most of them were born at home. But if we are doing, so in the healthcare, for example, if we are actually doing primary healthcare and, and community healthcare, for example, and we used to have that in our days, you, you have nurses in the brown uh, dress coming around, making sure all the children in the house had uh, the, uh, whatever they put in their mouth, so that vaccinations or something of this, yeah. right? This is community healthcare. Why did that stop? It didn't cost us extra. Why did that stop? We've been spending, what, over $2 billion every single year on health, and we can't get basic registration of beds right? Then we do have a problem, Daniel. So where, what is, so, so you feel the solution is getting healthcare professionals who at the moment, it's difficult to pay them because we, we have healthcare professionals at home that we can't absorb into the system mm. to go to the homes of people to register them. Well, I mean, the, the proportion of it, we, we need to look at the numbers. The, I, I'm not sure what the proportions of people who have been born at home is, uh, and we do need to be sure about that number. But what I am saying is that whether you, you focus as a government on primary health care or whether you focus as a government on secondary health care, you are still going to have some element of what uh, 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 community health care just because of the way our society is, mm. is, is, is structured. Mm. There's quite a huge number of people in the rural areas who cannot make it to the hospital, even mm -hmm. though there are hospitals in those regions. We should be able to reach them. They are Ghanaians too. Mm -hmm. And so um, we need to know what the numbers are in terms of, you know, how many people are being born at home. But whatever the case is, that Daniel, nobody should be born in this country and not have a certificate to show for it. That is just the most basic form of, of, of administration, right. health-wise. Finally, um, Mark, finally, how are you going to win an election which requires you to get the north of 4 million votes in the country, majority of which are going to be from rural populations. Mm. How are you going to do that? You, you, you doubt if I can? I'm asking you how you're going okay. to. Okay. I mean, we're, we're running an election. Uh, sorry, we're running a campaign. Um, I am already out there. We've got people on the ground who are out there. Uh, most people see us uh, and they feel that, you know, we're, we're just in Accra. It's not the case. Uh, we've got, you know, hundreds probably thousands of people mm -hmm. in the regions who are going, you know, on the ground, talking to their families, talking to their friends, putting up posters. There is work being done. How many volunteers do you have across the country? Oh, I couldn't even begin to count. Um, we've Give me got, a ballpark figure. Well, we've got, what I can tell you is that we've got about four layers of teams. Um, we've got uh, what we call the... Uh, the operational team, which is responsible for ensuring that the day-to-day -day things happen, you know, people are being communicated to what we are saying today, everybody gets to hear it, uh, and that I'm here today. Um, now, that is in a ballpark of about 30 of us, 30. Then you have the thematic team, which is, you know, a team that is responsible. So our manifesto, for example, there's a team responsible for health, there's a team responsible for infrastructure and all that, about 10, of, 10 people in each of those teams. So we're talking about another 100. Some of them are here, some of them work in Africa, some of them work outside the country. Uh, but we are able to work in that sort of dynamic space, not necessarily you have to be here. We've, we've, we've evolved. Um, and then, of course, then you have the regional teams that are, you know... Uh, and that's where my interest is. Mm. Those on the ground knocking on doors and telling right. people about my week. Those numbers are growing every day. I, I start getting calls from 5 a.m. every day. I hold one of the, the team phones. The, so it's the, we have phones. So, uh, can you give me a number? Uh, you know, on a regional level, I can tell you we've got nothing less than 1,000. At least that we know. At least 1,000 people across a, a the country. 1,000 people that we know are coordinating directly with the operational team. Mobilizing 4 million. They're going to do more than that. Like mm. I said, people are coming on board every single How day. How are you resourcing your team? We're resourcing by, you know, Ghanaians are paying for all of this. Since I started this announcement, since I made the announcement in 2019, every single thing we have done has been paid for by the ordinary Ghanaian. So how much have you spent so far? I, we haven't collated everything yet. So I can tell you for a fact that if something needs to be get, get done today, 
uh, we just put wet out. Somebody will probably call. And this is the reason why we can't give you a ballpark figure is because we can say, you know what, we need to shoot a couple of videos. We put it mm -hmm. out there on the platforms. Somebody might come up and say, oh, I have a studio in here. Just go in there. I've told my guys they will deal with it. Okay. Uh, you can't put a number on that because, you know, we don't know how much he's paying his boys or his team. And therefore, you know, uh, we, we get support from everywhere. Mark Kofi Gan, thank you very much thank for you. joining us this afternoon on The Pulse. My next guest is also an um, independent presidential candidate. His name is Samuel Oforia Mpofo. He joins us shortly after this. But let me just say that, um, yes, so biomedcentral.com is where I just did a rudimentary check. 75% of raw maternal deaths in Ghana are due to unskilled um, births, unskilled okay. and unsupervised births. Even in right. urban centers, 20% mm. of the deaths, 20% of all births mm. are, are, are not supervised by skilled birth attendants. Okay. So that should give so you So we do have a majority that are supervised. In urban areas, yes. in rural areas, to 75. Our population is that. Our population is not that urbanized. Thanks, Mark. Thank uh, Samuel Ofori Ampofu is next. Stay with us. <music> On the pulse, Samuel Ofori Ampofu, independent presidential candidate, is my guest. Mr. Ampofu, welcome. Thank you very much. So, why do you want to be president? <laughs> George? Daniel. Oh, Daniel. Good question. Thank you very much. Greetings to our listeners. Uh, Daniel, yes, I want to be president because I sincerely, deep down in my heart, believe that I have the revolutionary capacity and endowment uh, to move Ghana away from economic slavery. What do you call economic slavery? We, the country has, since 1992, the advent of the 1992 constitution, uh, and, and, and uh, PND, uh, NDC and MPP, been always uh, under the clutches of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And this, I, I look at as, as not too good for this country. You know, they always g g grant you loans and put restrictions that are not favoring you know, uh, this country at all. And I believe that we can develop uh, and, and make this country better from our own resources, local mm. resources. Mm. What is the experience you built over the years that will enable you to build this country you dream of? Well, I've been involved in Ghanaian politics uh, since 2006 when I started writing articles, critical articles uh, in the Ghanaian newspapers and um, Ghana web. And uh, at that time, I, I, I um, formed an association, Save Ghana Now Association, writing articles that were very critical uh, about our economy and you know, the, the whole uh, Ghanaian uh, way of life. And uh, many people registered as members of the Save Ghana Now Association. And uh, in 2008, uh, membership decided to uh, change in, into a political alternative and we formed, as a result, Ghana National Party in 2008. Uh, um, after extensive run round over the country uh, and in the national, uh, Ghana National Party Congress, the party delegates uh, overwhelmingly endorsed my candidature as the president, I mean, the candidate, presidential candidate for 2008 on Ghana National Party ticket. However, after extensive deliberations, I realized that um, it was too much financially, uh, uh, you know, on my, on, my, on my resources. And therefore, I decided to go down to my constituency, the Kwaibrim constituency and uh, to run as, as, an, uh, as a candidate, as a parliamentary candidate. As a parliamentary candidate. Yes. So you stepped down from presidential to parliamentary. Right. I wasn't on the ballot box as a president, but I was on the ballot box as a, a parliamentary candidate in my constituency, uh, thinking that I would be able to grab that seat for my party and would have been very good and a, a big plus for the party. But also, I didn't, I didn't win. The incumbent MPP guy 
we won the, the seat. So, um, running for president was too much for your finances in 2008. Right. What, what makes you think you can do it now? Well, from 2008 till now is uh, how many years? A, a good number of years. I, I have I've, uh, talked to a lot of friends and we thought that uh, we, 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 can, we can mobilize resources and do it together. And uh, when I launched my uh, campaign document, I, I, I made it clear to the people of Ghana that I donated that document as a presidential campaign platform for change to the people of Ghana, and therefore requested that the people of Ghana contribute. And for all of us, if they really believe that NDC and MPP are not changing their lives, after 28 years in office. Let them contribute and let us run a campaign against the NDC. So you receive contributions? Yes. How much? Well, we're we, we, we ripping in uh, bit by bit. How much has been received so far? So far, we have about 200,000. 200,000 Ghana, Ghana cities. cities? Yes. So how many volunteers do you have? Well, as a result of my uh, surgeon in uh, 2008 all over the country, I have representatives still uh, in the, in the, in the, throughout the constituencies and uh, districts and constituencies. And therefore, um, we are always in contact with them, and they are still uh, they're working, they're still working on that. Now, 200,000 Ghana cities is about 40, between 30 and 40,000 dollars. And CDD survey back in 20, well, just a couple of years back shows that it takes about $200,000 to run a successful parliamentary campaign in Ghana. Mm -hmm. They're very far from that figure. Well, um, it, it, we, we, we are not there yet. But I believe that the people of Ghana will, will contribute, con continue to contribute. And we will probably also have, we still uh, will have also yeah, uh, influence of capital, I mean, uh, cash from our friends in the diaspora. Right. Um, so what's your key policy alternative that you have? Uh, I, I am centralizing my, my, my campaign on the economy, jobs, and corruption. Three fundamental principles. Okay. And that is what I'm going to, you know, Stress on very much. Mm. Economy, jobs, and? Corruption. And corruption. Yeah. OK. How do you create jobs for an economy that has lost 45,000 of them because of COVID-19? Well, job creation, is that a question, right? Yeah. How do you create jobs when, you know, we've already lost 45,000 jobs because of COVID-19. How do you create jobs now? Over the last several years, uh, since 1992, the Kosibo Trade and the PNDC succumbed to the dictates of the IMF not to create jobs because they, con they were convinced that, or IMF convinced them that it isn't the business of government creating jobs. As a result of that, all industries that were then producing and, and, and hired Ghanaians were, 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 were sold or divested uh, uh, by, by, by the um, advice of the IMF. From that time began the, the enormous uh, unemployment situation in this country. And since then, we have always been running to the IMF for funds, for our national development, and they have always been dictating to us, don't hire people, don't hire people. And don't do this and do this, don't do this. We are always under the you know, uh, instructions of IMF. And that is what I think makes us being slaves under the policies of IMF. And none of the uh, IMF policies that have, has ever been introduced in our system has ever worked. Structural adjustment program, economic recovery program, and the rest of it never worked. So what will work for you? Well, for me, I believe that Ghan, uh, uh, government must take the initiative. The MPP, one district, one factory, this is a snail pace policy. It's not working. I have a strong feel 
the government must look for money, and I believe locally, and from east, set up about 10 industries. Go down to west, set up about 10 industries. I haven't set up the industries. You open up for local capitalization. The local people themselves will capitalize, capitalize those industries. Meaning they will invest in They them. will invest in it. From, from, from where? Uh, I mean, where do we find the money locally? Oh, Daniel, do you think people don't have money at all in the villages? No, they have. In my village, we, we set up Kwabibram Rural Bank. I was very instrumental. Kwabibram Rural Bank is now, you know, running about some billions of Ghana cities uh, capital. When a rural bank running billions of Ghana cities in capital. Well, I'm sorry. Maybe, <laughs> you know, uh, and even though we started, we started operating with just a, a, a million city, one million cities those days. Mm -hmm. Okay, the 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 the, 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 the 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 bank is now very very solvent, and therefore I have a strong feel that if not even my 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 my, my village. There are some other villages around the, you know, the countryside that people have a lot of money. And also, there are some guys that are from the villages and residing in Accra and Kumasi and the rest of the capital. And can invest, and in, can there. invest in there. Mr. Ofosan Prophet, thank you so much for joining us this, this afternoon. And all the best in, okay. your, in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Uh, Samuel Ofori Ampofo is, a, is an independent presidential candidate selling a locally owned industrialization plan. It's amazing. MFR Powell is hosting the event which takes place tomorrow. She will tell us what to expect right after this. Stay with us. This Thursday, the 13th of August, the Imani Center for Policy and Education and your election headquarters bring you the Minority Political Parties and Independent Candidates Election Debate live from the University of Professional Studies Accra, UPSA, from 8 p.m. Six independent candidates will lock horns in a rigorous interrogation of their ideas. Marik Kofigan, Kofi Kurante, S. Okori Ampopo, Carl Ebo Morgan, Unipayade, Osumte, and Dr. Tom Assise will have their policy alternatives scrutinized, moderated by head of the Joy News political desk, Evans Mensa, and Joy News anchor, Emefa Apau, the minority political parties, and independent candidates election debate live from 8 p.m. on Thursday, 13th August, from the UPSA, only on Joy 99.7 FM, Love 99.5 FM, on the Joy News Channel, our affiliates across the country, online, and across our social media platforms. MFR Power, like I said earlier, is hosting the event which takes place tomorrow. MFR, what do we expect? I'm hosting it together with Evan Spencer, mm, the head of mm, our political mm, desk. And this mm. debate is being organized um, to in, co in collaboration with Imani Ghana and then your election headquarters join you. So tomorrow, you know that over the period, um, before every election, we've had uh, presidential debates organized by the NCC, the IEA, and all, and most of them, uh, almost all of them, have focused on the two dominant political parties, which is the NPP and the NDC. So this one is a special purpose vehicle for just the minor political parties and of course the independent presidential candidates. I envy you at this point because you've had the privilege of speaking to all of them ahead of tomorrow and um, I've heard uh, Kofi Kranting uh, dying to have a handshake with you for instance <laughs> and uh, a number of them you've just had Marie Gan, you've had Samuel of Uswampo, Samuel Ampofo, Kofi Ampofo I should say and then uh, you've had you've hosted Onipayede, uh, Onipayede Osumte yeah. and Kali He's one person Morgan. I'm looking forward to meeting Onipayede, well. Onipayede is, uh, Osumte. As his name is. Why Onipayede? Have you had the opportunity <laughs> to ask him? <laughs> <laughs> the meaning of it. Okay, so when you buy it, I'm sure yeah. that's what uh, we say. So that's how it's going to be tomorrow. You've had the opportunity. So we'll have all of them on one platform uh, this time telling us what their alternatives will be, exactly. why the ordinary Ghanaian should vote for them. So uh, most of the questions we've received from the ordinary Ghanaian. Uh, the team have also put together and it's going to cover the various sectors of the economy. 
So why we should vote for them? We'll be giving them that opportunity, that exclusive opportunity. It's happening at the University of Professional Studies, um, Accra. That's in Medina. And it's starting at 8 p.m. And this will be different from everything that you've seen in terms of presidential debates in this country. Beautiful. So uh, this is where you should be. And it will be on all our social media platforms, uh, on Joy 99.7 FM, on myjoyonline.com, on Facebook, on Twitter. Everywhere is covered when it comes to uh, this minority parties and independent uh, presidential candidates. So this particular edition will focus on just the independent presidential candidates. The next one will be for the minority political parties in the country. MFR Paul, it's amazing. I can't wait for tomorrow to see you I can't in wait action. To see that. Together uh, with, with Evans, Evans Mensa. And all the rest of the guys. That's coming up tomorrow. You heard her at 8 p.m. Yes. Yes, at University of Professional Studies Accra. If you want to join us, of course, remember it's going to be a COVID-19 safe atmosphere. All the safety protocols will be applied. So you might want to reach out to us on social media so that we can walk you through exactly how you can join us. Uh, but we are live on all our social media platforms, of course, on Joy News and Joy FM as well. We're going to take just a few messages. When we come back, there's more on The Pulse. Welcome back. Now, the management of the Community Water and Sanitation Agency, CWSA, has described accusations leveled against the agency of refusing to pay suppliers of water for government's free water initiative as part of COVID-19 relief package to rural and small towns and villages as false and unsubstantiated. According to the chief executive of CWSA, Walanyo Kojo Siabi, the agency is in the process of validating data presented by the Association of small towns water supply systems before payments are made. Um, the water service providers, they are supposed to submit this data to our regional offices in all the regions. Then our regional offices will collate because there are so many of these providers. So they are supposed to collate all of them based on districts and regions and then submit to our head office so we can, we can then pay. There are a lot of difficulties, and I will tell you some of the difficulties that come up with the information that we want. You have provided service, bring us information according to a certain format so that we can understand, our ministry can understand, Ministry of Finance can also understand. The resources are supposed, uh, will be provided by Ministry of Finance. They should understand the data, otherwise it will be difficult for them to just give us money, go and pay. Pay who? How much? What amount of water have they provided? You know, so some of the problems we, we, we had, we have provided service uh, April, May, and June already. We asked the providers, give us your data. Some have provided April, some have provided up to May, June they haven't provided. Okay, now we have also noted that they have set aside the guidelines and provided the information the way they want it. Somebody just, uh, a provider just wrote, May, uh, April, I have given, uh, I'm just using a, 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 an amount of money. We have provided, and the total amount is uh, 150,000. So kindly take the necessary steps to pay us. Okay, they didn't tell us how much water they have, they have supplied. They didn't tell us how much a unit, uh, 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 what, cubic meter cost, you know. There is no other information, that is it. Some have submitted electricity cost to us. And uh, when we check, you see, we have noted when we started the reforms that most of these water systems in the communities, they have outstanding bill over 40 million cities. That is the quantum of outstanding bills they have in their name with ECG, VRA, and grid code. So within this period, they realized that, okay, this is a chance to pay all this, this thing. So they included this as being the the electricity they have uh, paid within the period. But we have to validate. We have to, you have to tell us how much you have paid. We have to go to 
the electricity companies and find out whether it is true. You know, we have this as one of the, the challenges. As a live on the pulse with me, Daniel Dazin. Now let's go back to that story where the CWSA says government is ready to pay for claims once validations are completed. We have made an arrangement to validate, collect the data, validate it, and pay. So once we are sure that you have provided free water, you will be paid. You see, we also have to make sure we look at the cost of water. You can't come and say that okay, I have fixed my tariff. Um, I'm going to charge you, for every cubic meter, I will charge you, uh, what, uh, 20 cities. When public, uh, what, PURC has agreed that it should be like this, or CWSA has agreed that it should be like this. So we are looking at all of this. And a number of providers are just taking advantage and trying to provide figures that are not justified. Now. We have been looking at this data for almost a week. And uh, today is the last day that they will submit uh, the validated uh, data. And then we will pay. We will pay advance to all the providers where we have, we are sure that uh, the data is clean. What we are trying to do is we will present their data as it is. And then we will also present what we think from the conversation we had with the community members. And then some of them will say, oh, uh, we couldn't measure the water we have provided. Yeah, so, because if you have a certain uh, population of a community, if you have 200 people in a community, we, we know how much at least, approximately how much water they can use. So we are using all of this and for all of us to agree, to have a common uh, agreement, then we can, we can pay them. So what we are trying to do is, um, we'll pay them in advance, and then we'll submit the Essex. Now on the 23rd of July, 2020, leadership of the Association of Small Towns Water Supply Systems, Ghana, issued a statement threatening to withdraw their services to supply Ghanaians with free water, as announced by the president. As a live on the pulse, and the district director of health for the KJB district in the OT region, Eric Nanatechi, has revealed that the unavailability of funds at the directorate is impeding the fight against COVID-19 in the district. According to the director, surveillance is becoming a challenge as the directorate does not have enough funds to support the process. He adds the directorate would sometimes have to rely on support from members of his staff to send samples collected to testing centers. Peter Senu has more. Since the advent of COVID-19 into the country some five months ago, the District Director of Health for the KDB District, Eric Nanatechi, has received PPE from various institutions with one appeal, asking for more to stem the fight against COVID-19. The appeal this time is for cash and fuel for COVID-19 surveillance after he received some PP from a philanthropist, Bawa Faisal. According to the health director, it is difficult conducting surveillance due to unavailability of funds. I can say it has shown quantity, meaning saliva alone does not work. You see, the main challenge we have regarding the fight of COVID in the district is mainly funds. We are challenged with this surveillance. Today, a facility will call you they are suspecting COVID case. Quickly, you have to move there with your car and petrol. You pick the sample, you have to transport it all the way to home. So before you finish surveillance on just a particular case, about 500 Ghana cities is gone. Almost every day, you receive calls from communities. You have to follow up, pick their samples, take it to home. So in a month, the district spent close to about 7,000 just on surveillance cases, taking the samples, taking to home, doing contact tracing, transporting them to isolating center, managing them, feeding them, about 7,000 goals. But we don't seem to receive much from above. If you are serious a challenge, sometimes individuals have to sacrifice their mega salary just to fight or champion this cause. Maybe you can equally mobilize your people to at least contribute your widow's might in the form of cash or fuel just to support us in surveillance activities that we very much appreciate. 
The philanthropist Power Faisal is appealing to residents to continue to apply strictly the various protocols, especially the wearing of the face mask, adding COVID-19 is real. Where I work, we, we, we are still working from home because we realize that it is real and, and people should not think that it is far from them, no. The challenge with COVID is that you may not be able to identify physically somebody who has it. And that is what makes it difficult. So we should continuously use the face masks, wash our hands as, as often as possible, and then we should be able to physically distance even when we are sitting around in our area. So that at least we minimize the, the, the spread within the community. The recent to join the COVID-19 fight in the district is World Vision International. They have provided a number of semi-automated hand-washing facilities and other PPE to the KTB District Assembly and other decentralized agencies in the district. Salome Yebua is the Nkwanta Cluster Manager, World Vision International. As an organization, we have realized that fighting the pandemic, that's COVID-19, it's a shared responsibility. This is something that the government cannot do alone. So as an organization, we deem it proper to actually ensure that we support them with the item, these PPEs, to help them fight the disease or the pandemic. Peter Sanu for Joy News. Live on the Pulse with me, Daniel Daz. It's time for Sports with Gary L. Smith. Stay with us. Many thanks to Daniel for those updates. Time now for the sport. I'm Gary L. Smith. After Europa League fair, it's time for the big one, the Champions League. We have a marathon of today, tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday for the quarterfinals. Two matches a day. And today's installment is Italian and it's French. PSG are 50 years old today. And they will look to mark that anniversary by beating Atalanta when they meet in Germany today. And to do an analysis with me is Bill Eshen of the Joy Sports Desk. So these are the matches for the next couple of days. Atalanta, PSG, RB Leipzig, Atleti, Barca, Bayern, and Man City, Leon. Hello, Bill. First of all, um, we've been looking forward to Atalanta as exciting as they have been this season, haven't we? Yeah, Atlanta has been a quite big surprise in the, in the competition. Of course, even in the Serie A, they've been a free scoring side. They were able to score 98 goals. That is astonishing. That is a very, very big, big goal margin. And they've been able to produce the goods in the Champions League, surprising a lot of opponents, scoring the goals with their 3-4-3 formation, with their coach, with some of the players like Papu Gomez, like Elicic and the rest. They've been able to produce the goods. They've been able to play very, very attractive football, and I, I dare say they do pose a very big challenge for PSG. Yeah, PSG, though, uh, we are told that they are one of the best pressing sites in Europe, apart from or apart with Liverpool. How will Atalanta really look to go past them? Well, uh, I think breaking down the PSG goal line, I think uh, for now, one of their key midfielders, like Verratti, is out of the game. And he was key to, you know, keeping the solidity whilst being able to help the team attack. And that brings, you know, opens more of the floodgates because Marquinhos now has to move to the DM position. So that makes it a bit loose when it comes to the defensive aspect because Kimpembe has to slot in. And that leaves a chance for the likes of Zapata, the likes of Papu Gomez and the rest to try and attack and try and get the goods, try and get the goals. But the absence of Ilicic is a problem. So okay. it is going to be a very, very tough one. Nice one. Game starts at 7 p.m. You will be on duty on Twitter from 6 p.m. And we'll be looking forward to it, Bill. Thank you for your time. So Champions League Fair, four days of action begins with Joy Sports. And from 6 p.m. on Twitter, you can get all the build-up. Join us on Radio from 6.30, I'll be doing commentary with George Adu Jr. And these are the ways to join the conversation on social media. Thank you for your time. I'm Gary L. Smith. We'll be finishing the bulletin shortly. And this is where we bring the pulse to an end. My name is Daniel Daze. See you tomorrow.